everybody stand up on your feet this morning. We're a little bit fewer in number, but that doesn't mean that the power of God is diminished in the church. Where two or three are gathered in his name, there he is in the midst. I believe we've got more people in this church today than they had when many people were healed throughout the scriptures. Because they were going from house to house, very small houses that not many could fit in. But we've got a pretty big building today, and we've got plenty of people here. So I believe that if you come with an expectation today, God can do exceedingly, abundantly, above all we can ask, or even imagine according to the power that worketh in us. That sweet spirit, that Holy Ghost power, that is the power that works in us. As individuals and as a body, that power works in us. So if you will come believing today, if you have a need, if you need to be touched in any way, God can do that. And He can do it in such a way. He can do it in such a way that you can testify of the goodness of God. And those people out in the world won't believe what you have to say. They won't have a clue what's going on because they don't understand the power of God like we understand the power of God. But He's touched you already. He's done so much for you already. He's healed your body already. He's touched your finances already. Won't He do it again? Won't He do it again if you have a need? Father, we thank you so much for what you've already done in our lives. We thank you that if we just come with an expectation that you will do exceedingly abundantly above all we can ask or even imagine according to the power that worketh in us. Now, God, I ask that you would just rain down in this place, that you would send your spirit, Lord, that if anybody would have a need in this church house today, Lord, that they would obey the commands and they would call upon the elders of the church, anointing them with oil, and the prayer of faith shall save the sick. Oh God, just have your way in this house. Do your perfect will, not man's will, not our will. Let us get out of the way, oh God, and let your spirit flow from breast to breast and move from person to person. Touch the singers, oh God. Touch the worshipers today. Lord, that they would be anointed from the top of their head to the bottom of their feet. Lord, that they would sing like they've never sang before, that they would play like they've never played before. Touch this congregation today, oh God. Let the men lead the church into worship this morning. Oh, Lord, just have your way in this house. In Jesus' name.
Hallelujah. Saints of God, let's just praise him. You keep on. Hallelujah. Let's just lift hands everywhere around him. Let's just give God the praise. Amen. Despite of the equipment failure. Amen. Despite of going in and out. Let's just give God the praise this morning. Amen. The Bible says he's worthy of the praise. He said if we didn't praise him, he would even cause the rocks to cry out on our behalf. So saints of God, this morning, let some exchange take place in your spirit. Amen. If you, if you got a spirit of heaviness, let God exchange for you the garment of praise this morning. And if you got some mourning, amen, let God give you some exchange for some oil of joy this morning, amen. You might just have ashes left over, but let God exchange some ashes for some beauty this morning. Because the Bible says, he said, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me this morning? Saints of God, I wish you would just praise him this morning. Out of the, out of the normal this morning. My God in heaven, if you got to make your way out of the pew, if you got to make your way through the aisle, this morning. I wish somebody would give God the praise. Somebody would give God all the glory because he's worthy of the praise. He's worthy of the glory. He's worthy of the honor. Who is like him, amen? Who has redeemed your soul? Who pulled you up out of the miry clay? Who set your foot upon a solid rock? Who established your going this morning? It is the Lord, and besides him, the Bible says there is no other God. Let's praise
praise Him this morning, amen, because He's everything I need. He's everything I need this morning. Let's praise Him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God, we give you all the praise, Lord. Oh, God, we give you the glory. Oh, God, we magnify the name of Jesus this morning, Lord. Oh, God, we just take a moment, God, to praise you, oh, God. Oh, God, to magnify the wonderful name of Jesus, oh, God. Let's praise Him. If you got a need this morning, you must praise Him, amen. If you got a need this morning, you need to praise Him. Because He's got everything you would need. And if you'll praise Him, He'll have it your praise this morning. Come on, saints of God. Give Him the praise. Give Him the glory.
sure which one to grab, but this one works, so we'll, we'll let it roll. Maybe. Did it I'll use the mic. Hallelujah. Glory to God this morning. God, I just praise him. <laughs> oh, God, I just praise him this morning. God, he's so worthy of the praise. Is he not, saints of God? God, he's so worthy of the glory. All the honor goes back to Jesus. I'm nobody outside the grace of God. Not a dog. Not even fit to keep. Outside the grace of God, friend, we're nobody. But thank you, Jesus, for the Savior. Thank you, Lord. I'm excited this morning. I've got a stirring in my spirit this morning. I'm excited this morning. I'm glad this morning that the equipment didn't stop us from praising God. I'm glad this morning that the circumstances of the way the music sounded didn't stop us from giving God all the glory. God, we praise Him anyway. And if you didn't notice in that moment when we, when we begin to praise God, that's when the atmosphere really began to change in the body of Christ. Amen. When the, when the equipment failed, we could just sit down and say, well, you know what, we'll just, we'll just call it quits right here. But no, somebody said, I got to praise him. Somebody said, I got to give him all the glory. So I'm excited this morning because we're going to be preaching on the glory of God this morning. Hallelujah. Amen. I'm excited for this. Hallelujah. If you got your Bibles, let's pray real quick before we go into this. Father, in the holy name of Jesus. Oh, God, we thank you, Lord, so much for meeting us here, right here and right now. Dear God, we pray. We know, Father God, and we believe, dear God, that you can do exceedingly and abundantly, God, above all that I could even ask or could possibly think, according to the power, Father, that works in each and every one of us, Father. Lord, touch this clay, oh, God, this morning. Touch my mind, oh, God. Lord, touch my mind with the word of God. Let us sow it, Lord, in the right spirit. Spirit, oh God, we pray. We pray for an anointing, God, a divine anointing, God, of the Holy Ghost, God, to preach your word. Oh God, we give you praise. Oh God, we give you glory this morning. God, prepare this body, dear God, to receive the word of God. Lord, open their hearts, open their ears, God, to be ready to receive the word of God. And we'll give you praise for it, oh God. Glory and honor. Lord, we step aside this morning. Put me in the cleft of the rock this morning. Be the shade upon my right hand, oh God, we pray. In the holy name of Jesus, we agree. Amen and amen. Saints of God, I'm excited this morning, amen. I know i got to kind of teach a little bit, but by the grace of God, I'm going to preach too, amen. Yeah, I'm excited this morning. If you got your Bibles, turn them to 1 Samuel. We'll start in the first, cha we'll start in the first chapter of 1 Samuel. We're going to be talking about the glory of the Lord, amen, the glory of the Lord. Brother Chris, you care to get me a water, brother? Thank you, sir, God. One mind, amen. Amen. So in 1 Samuel... Chapter two or chapter one, uh, we're going to get we're going to talk about how Hannah prayed for Samuel, and we're really not going to focus on so much. Thank you, sir. As Hannah, you know, bringing forth Samuel, although Samuel is a big part of the story, we're going to focus really heavily on the priest Eli and his two sons. So the Bible says uh, in First Samuel chapter one verse nine. Once after the sacrifice, the sacrificial, this is the New Living Translation. Uh, once after a sacrificial meal at Shaul, Hannah got up and went to pray. And Eli, so Eli's the priest over the house of God, okay? Eli the priest was sitting at his customary place beside the entrance of the tabernacle. Hannah was in deep anguish, crying bitterly as she prayed to the Lord. And she made this vow. O Lord of heaven's army, if you will look upon my sorrow and answer my prayer and give me a son, then will I give him back to you. He will be yours for his entire lifetime. And as a sign that he has been dedicated to the Lord, his hair will never be cut. The Bible says in verse 12, as she was praying to the Lord. Now, we're going to get into how Eli pretty much was compromising in the house of God. And, and his sons were totally corrupt. So we're, we're going to get into that. But I want you to have a mindset before we go any further on Eli disobeyed God by letting his sons do, had done whatever they wanted to do in the house of God. And they received no correction other than one time by their father 
But Eli never stopped them from doing the corruption that they were doing. We'll get into what they was doing. So Eli here was willing to tell Hannah in verse 13, seeing her lips moving and hearing no sound, he thought she had been drinking. It's the priest of the house of God. Hannah is in such stress here. She's in such anguish. The Bible says deep anguish. She's crying bitterly. She's praying, Lord, if you'll just give me a child. Lord, I vow to you that I'll even give him back to you. And he'll serve you all the days of your life. All the days of his life. So Eli said that Hannah had been drinking. Verse 14. Must you come here and drink? The priest said. He demanded. Throw away your wine. Hannah said, oh no, sir. She replied. I haven't been drinking wine or anything stronger, but I, I, but I am very discouraged. And I was pouring out my heart to the Lord. Don't think I am a wicked woman, for I have been praying out of great anguish and sorrow. In the case, Eli said, go in peace. May the God of Israel grant your request if you as asked him. Verse 18. Oh, thank you, sir, she exclaimed. Then she went back and began to eat again, and she was no longer sad. So we're going to kind of skip through this just a little bit. Hannah uh, here conceives later on, and then she bears forth a son, and she bears forth Samuel. So God answered Hannah's prayer. God gives Samuel to Hannah, and Hannah and Samuel at this point is uh, almost winged off by Hannah. He's still on the milk at this point, and uh, it said that right here in verse twenty. And in due time, she would give birth to a son. His name was Samuel. Uh, for she said, I have asked the Lord for him. Verse 21. The next year, Elkanah and his family, this is Hannah's husband, and his family went on their way to the trip to the offer the sacrifice to the Lord and to keep his vow. But Hannah did not go. She told the Lord, she told her husband, wait until the boy is weaned. Then I will take him to the tabernacle. And I find it kind of funny. This is kind of funny right here. The husband replies, well, you know, whatever you think's best, he agreed, it says. So, uh, and, you know, at this point, the child, and I, it kind of reminds me to think of, you know, kind of Brother Jonathan's situation this morning. Because I've been talking to Brother Jonathan, and I'm like, you know, Brother Jonathan's listening to a little baby wit and, you know, cry and be really fussy. And it'd be something that Brooke said, let's take him on down to Pastor Jerry. We'll just give him over to the Lord. And it'd be funny if he said, well, yeah, that's right. Y'all, that, let's do that. Amen. Let's do it. So her husband said, let's just do that. That's fine. Whatever you think will be all right. Which I know he loves his child. He would never do that. So. Uh, but she said, uh, but he said, stay here for now, and the Lord will help you and keep your promise. So she stayed in the house and nursed the boy until he was weaned. So Hannah ends up, to, I'm going to kind of skip this for the sake of reading it. So Hannah, after, after Samuel comes to the point to where he can be given over to the priest, Samuel is raised under the priest Levi. And so Samuel's in the house of God. Uh, the Bible even says that Samuel uh, is wearing, even as a young boy, he's wearing the priest's clothing and the vest of the priest. So he's being raised under this priest, Eli. So we're going to jump down because Hannah in chapter 2 really begins this praise of prayer all the way down just to about probably past verse 10. So we're going to kind of skip that because praise God, she gave a good praise to God for that. We thank God for that. But verse 12, let's talk about the wicked sons of Eli. Now, the sons of Eli were scoundrels. Uh, that's what the New Living Translation says, but they were wicked men. Uh, uh, they, I think the King James says they were corrupt men or wicked men who had no respect for the Lord or for their duties as priests. Now, rem now remember now, not only was Eli the priest over the house of God, both his sons were, and both of his sons were helping, uh, having dealings with the sacrifices that were coming in. They were in charge of that. So the Bible says here in verse 13, for their duties of, as a priest, whenever anyone offered a sacrifice, Eli's sons would send over a servant with a three-pronged fork. While the, meal, while the meat of the sacrifice of the animal was still boiling, the servant would stick the fork into the pot and demand whatsoever be brought up would be given to Eli's sons. All the Israelites who came to worship at Shaol were treated this way. So the Eli's sons, honey, I think it's, let's see here. Give me just a second. Eli's two sons were so corrupt that they would send a priest, or they would send a servant into the sacrifice. And they would tell that servant, well, take this three-pronged fork. And even while the animal is still boiling, I want you to go there and just go ahead and jab that thing. 
And you bring out whatever I, you bring out whatever it gets. If it brings a rib, you bring all the ribs out of it. And you bring the fat with it. And the Bible says in Leviticus that the fat is to be burned up for the Lord. So these men, including Levi, were in complete disobedience with the offerings and treating God's offering with contempt. They would take these offerings and take what they wanted to from it and then pretty much give God the dog portion of the meat and expect God to be okay with that. So they're completely disobedient, disobedient on what they were because a, a priest would get a specific portion of meat from the sacrifice. And they were taking whatever they wanted to. Verse 15. Sometimes a servant would even come even before the animal's fat had been burned, like we said, on the altar. He would demand the raw meat before it had been burned, before it had been boiled, so that he could use it for roasting. So the priest's like, well, just go ahead and get me the raw meat. I want to roast it. I want to make it any way I want to. I'm not going to let you boil it the way you want to. They didn't, he didn't want to let them sacrifice it the way they wanted to. He wanted to do it his way. The man offering the sacrifice might reply, take as much as you want, but the fat must be burned first. Then the servant would demand, no, give me it now or I'll take it by force. So the sin of these young men were very serious in the Lord's sight. They trusted, for they treated the Lord's offering with content. Look at this. But Samuel, though he was only a boy, served the Lord. He wore a linen garment like that of the priest each year. So let me jump down to verse 22. And at this point, Eli's getting up in his age here. And the Bible says in verse 22, Now Eli was very old. And when he was aware that his sons were doing, what he, when he was aware of what his sons were doing to the people, he knew, for instance, that his sons were subduing the young women who assisted in the entrance of the tabernacle. So not only, again, that's pretty, it's pretty self-explanatory. So not only were they sleeping with these young women, they were, they were despising God's offering and taking what they wanted to from it. So God had had enough. So this is the only area of correction that Eli had given to his sons right here. He said, you must stop, in verse 24, you must stop, my sons. The report I hear among the Lord's people are not good. If anyone sins against another person, God can mediate for the guilty party. But if someone sins against the Lord, who can intercede? And I thank God that Christ interceded for us. Amen. I thank, amen, he's the mediator. There's only one mediator between God and man, and that man is Christ Jesus. So I thank God now that there's somebody, even though at one time in my life I did transgress against God. I did. I, I, I mean, I, I completely did against all the commandments of God, nearly. And the Bible says that Jesus forgive us of our sin because he becomes sin who knew no sin. Amen. But Eli's sons would not listen to their father for the Lord was already planning for their death. Meanwhile, the boy Samuel grew taller and grew in favor with the Lord and the people. Now listen to this right here. This is a warning that God has given to Eli's family. One day, a man of God came to Eli and gave him the message from the Lord. I re this is what the Lord said to Eli. I revealed myself to your ancestors when they were, at Fer when they were Pharaoh's slaves in Egypt. I chose your ancestor Aaron from among all the tribes of Israel to be my priest and offer sacrifices on my altar, to burn incense, to wear the priestly vest, and he served me. And I assigned the sacrificial offerings to you priests. So why do you scorn my honor? Why do you scorn my sacrifices and my offerings? Why do you give your sons more honor than you give me? For you and they have become fat from the best offering, offerings of the people of Israel. Now again, now the Lord told Eli, he said, why are you so concerned about what your sons think and you have no fear of what I've told you? You have no regard for, what, for my standards. You have no regard for my commandments, but yet you would rather not offend your children. You'd rather not offend your two sons, but you would rather offend me. And, and this is going back to when Eli would pretty much rebuke Hannah but he wouldn't rebuke his own children. He, how dare him? He would go to Hannah and say, you woman, you are drunk. She's like, I'm not even drunk. I'm, I'm praying. I'm mourning. But he would not even correct his own children. He wouldn't even, the only time he said something to him is like, you know, who's going to atone for your sin? That's it. Eli never put a stop to anything his sons were doing in total rebellion to the word of God. Therefore, the Lord, the God of Israel says in verse 30, I promised that your branch of the tribe of Levi would always be my priest. 
but will honor the, but I will honor those who honor me and I will spy those despise those who think lightly of me the time is coming when I will put an end to your family so it will be no long so it will no longer serve their time none will reach their age you will watch them envy as I pour out prosperity on the people of Israel but no members of your family will ever live out their days. In other words, they wouldn't live long in their life. They'd die before their time. The few that are not cut off from serving at my altar will serve. Look at this right here. The Lord's like, you know, I did promise, you know, the Levites that, you know, I would keep you guys as priests. He said, so I'm not going to take all your family out. He said, but the ones that end up surviving, he said, I'm going to cause them to, uh, right here it says, the ones that survive, and that are not cut off from serving me, he said their eyes are going to go blind, their hearts break, and their children will die a violent death. And to prove what I have said will come true, I will cause your two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, to die on the same day. Then I will raise up faithful priests who will serve and do what I desire, and I will establish his family, and I will be a priest, and, and they will be a priest to my anointed kings forever. Then all of your surviving family will bow down before him begging for money and food please they will say give us jobs among the priests that we will have enough to eat so God had just come now God a man of God literally had just come to Eli and and just told Eli of the warning of God and Eli takes no, he takes a lot of it he doesn't listen to it. He does, he does nothing to put this in force. He does nothing to change this. He does nothing to correct this. So God begins to speak to little old Samuel, a little old like shepherd boy, little old David, little old Samuel at this time, just a boy. Uh, the Bible says when God was calling Samuel in the third chapter, uh, the Bible says that God calls Samuel four times before Samuel even understands that God's calling Samuel. So Samuel is in the house, or Samuel is in, he's asleep near the tabernacle and near the ark of God. That'd be a blessing at this point in time. Imagine that, sleeping in the tabernacle near the ark of God. And the ark of God in that area and in that presence which contained the full glory of God. I'm like, wow, that would be an amazing thing to sleep around the ark of God. And suddenly the Lord called out to Samuel. Samuel, he replied, what is it? He got up and ran into Eli and said, here am I, did you call me? That's the first time. A second time, he went back down, laid down. Samuel come right back in again to Eli. Heard, heard the same voice, Samuel, ran back in. Happened a third time. Samuel, he ran back into Eli. And he's like, and Eli's like, I didn't call you. But Eli realized that the, that the fourth time that he said, Eli realized that the Lord was speaking to Samuel. And Eli told Samuel, he said, the next time you hear that voice, he said, you say, Lord, here am I, speak. I'm listening. So the fourth time, Samuel says in chapter 3, verse 10, and the Lord came and called before Samuel, Samuel, verse, this is still verse 10, and Samuel replied, speak, your servant is listening. Then the Lord said to Samuel, I am about to do a shocking thing in Israel. I am, a, I am going to carry out all my threats against Eli and his family from the beginning to the end. I will, for, I will have... I have warned him that judgment is coming upon his family forever because his sons are blaspheming God and he has not disciplined them. Verse 14. So I have vowed, this is one of the most disturbing scriptures I think I've ever come across. Verse 14 of the third chapter. God said, so I have vowed that the sins of Eli and his sons will never be forgotten by sacrifice or by offering thinking, oh my gosh. Mm. Verse uh, 15, Samuel stayed in the bed until morning. Then he got up and opened the doors to the tabernacle as usual. He was afraid to tell Eli what the Lord said to him. But Eli called out to Samuel and said, my son, here am I. And Samuel replied, he said, my son. And Samuel replied, here am I. Uh, where, what did the Lord say to you? This is Eli asking Samuel. Tell me everything. And he said, may God strike you and kill you if you hide anything from me. So Samuel told Eli everything. He didn't hold back anything. It is the Lord's will, Eli replied. Let him do what he thinks best. I'm thinking, how foolish was that right there? I mean, you know, yeah, yeah, it was the Lord's will, but you caused that. I mean, are you ignorant? I mean, well, you know, yeah, God's going to kill him, but great is the will of God. I, nothing I can do about it. I, I can't change it. I couldn't do nothing about it. 
it? You know, I, I couldn't stop this from happening, Brother Joe. This was, this was the will of God, so great is the will of God. You know, despite of him, you know, God's like, you know, Samuel, he done nothing to correct them. But, mm, no, that was, that was because of what Eli did. That was Eli's decisions. Amen. So, so Samuel tells Eli everything, and Eli says, all right, what's the will of God? So Samuel grows up, and he keeps continues serving uh, in the house of the Lord with Eli. And at this point, in the midst of all of this, in the midst of them taking the sacrifices and abusing them, in the midst of them men treating the, the people of Israel in such a disgusting way, uh, committing fornication, I mean, they were taking the offerings, robbing God's people, robbing God. In the midst of all this rebellion and this disobedience, God had done told them, God had done told them, I'm going to take them out. I'm tired of this. I've had enough of this. I've had enough of this rebellion. I've had enough of this disobedience. Your lineage is done to a point, and the people that are remaining from your lineage are going to be blind, brokenhearted. They're going to die before their time, and they're going to die a gruesome death. So, and, and remember now, the Lord said, now I'm going to show you who I am. He said, you just remember. He said, I'm going to take both of your sons out, Hophni and Phinehas, all in the same day, just to show you that what I've told you is the truth of what I said. So chapter 4, it says, now Israel was in the battle of the Philistine army. And so Israel goes out. Now, now remember now, Israel's in the total rebellion. They go out to fight the Philistine army. They lose. I mean, they absolutely lose. The Bible says that 4,000 men die in the fourth chapter in the first battle. So they, in the, they come back from the first battle. The, the elders asked them, what happened that you lost the war? What had caused the Lord from us losing this battle? What happened that you lost the fight? And uh, so... These men begin to think in their minds, if we would take the ark of the Lord into the battle with us this next time, well, the glory of the Lord will be with us. So if we take the ark of God with us, then surely we'll win the battle. Surely we'll win the fight if we take the ark with us, this anointed, the glory of God that inhabit the ark, that God's blessed every time it's been around when it's been in the right hands. Surely if we take this with us, God will bless it and we'll win the battle. Battle two takes place. And Hophni and Phinehas are involved with, they, <laughs> how it, they take the ark of the covenant out of the house of God. Take this thing into battle with them. I'm thinking, how? You, you're in rebellion. You're in total disobedience of sin. You're in total rebellion. You're, you don't even know God. You're a wicked person. And you think just because that, you know, you're going to take the ark of God that God's going to overlook your sin and God's going to honor your life. A foolish man. So the Bible says in verse 4 that Hophni and Phinehas were there when the ark of the covenant of God was brought forth. So I know them jokers has something to do with that ark coming out of the house of God. I know they did. It said they right there with it. Bunch of corrupt men, bunch of jokers taking the ark of God out of the house of God, taking it into battle. Now look what happens right here. The Philistines are at this point Going down from verse 5, the Bible says that the Philistines begin to shake and tremble because they hear this crazy noise uh, from, the, from the Israelites because the Ark of the Covenant is being brought through. And God's people are just praying. They, they're seeing this Ark and they're just beginning to praise Him. And the Bible says that God's people praised so much because the Ark was coming through that the ground began to shake. So the, it, the Philistine says, what's going on? What's all the shouting about in the Hebrew camp? Verse uh, Verse 6 of chapter 4. What's all the shouting about in the Hebrew camp? When they was told it was because the ark of the Lord have arrived, they panicked. The gods have come into their camp, they cried. What a disaster. We have never hid to face anything like this. We have never had to face anything like this before. Help, who can save us from these mighty gods of Israel? These are the gods that destroyed the Egyptians with plagues when Israel was in the wilderness. Now the Philistine leaders said, fight, O Philistines, like never before. Because if we don't fight with all of our might, we're going to become slaves to the Israelites just like the Israelites were enslaved to us. So they did. So, the Israel, so verse 10 of chapter 4, the Israelites fought desperately and Israel was defeated again. The slaughter was great. 30,000 Israelites slaughtered that day. The survivor turned. You look at this right here. Eli's blind at this point. He's old. He's 98 years old, this man is. He's blind at this point. Well, what did God say? I'm going to blind you guys. 
I'm tired of this. You're going to be blind. You're going to have bad hearts. You're going to die before your time. You're going to die a horrible death. Eli was blind at this point, old in his age. This servant makes his way out of the battle, running up the road. He begins to tell everybody what's going on, what just took place in the battle. Verse 13 of chapter 4, Eli was waiting beside the road to hear the news of the battle. <laughs> for his heart trembled for the safety of the ark. I'm thinking, you dummy. <laughs> You're, what, what do you mean your heart trembled for the safety of the ark? You didn't care about the safety of the ark. Eli, who are you kidding? You let, you let your corrupt sons take the ark out of the house of God into battle. You had no regard for the ark of God. So the Bible says in verse 17, uh, verse, let's go to verse 15. Let's go to verse 14. <laughs> uh, when it was noise abroad, Eli asked the messenger that rushed over to Eli, who was 90 and eight years old and was blind. Eli said, I have just come from the, or, or, and he said to Eli, the servant said to Eli, I just come from the battle. I was there this very day. When, what happened, my son Eli demanded? Israel has been defeated by the Philistines. The messenger replied, the people have been slaughtered. Your two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, or some people pronounce it now Phinehas, were also killed in the ark of God had been captured. <laughs> you, look, you look at this right here. Verse 18. This is, <laughs> gosh almighty. Verse 18. <laughs> gosh, this is crazy. Verse 18, if I can get to it. When the messenger mentioned what had happened to, <laughs> to the ark of God, <laughs> Eli fell backward from his seat beside the gate and broke his neck and died. Oh, my God, holy smokes. It ain't done yet, friend. This gets crazy. It, gets, it goes on, but here this man is, and the Bible says that he was overweight. <laughs> it says he was overweight, old and feeble. He blind. God just he fell back after he heard it and broke his neck and gone, friend. And uh, remember what God has said. I'm, I'm putting a curse, a generational curse on this family. And uh, let's go on. Verse 19, and so Eli's daughter-in-law, this is the wife of Phineas or Phineas, was pregnant. Eli's son's daughter. So, it's Eli, so the daughter-in-law to Eli was pregnant and was near to her delivery. Verse 19. When she had heard that the ark of God had been captured and that her father-in-law and that her husband are dead, she went into labor and gave birth. So it, had, it put her in such distress. It threw her right into labor. She was close to giving anyway, but she was so you know, so such and such distress and anguish that she right immediately began to give birth. Verse 20, she died in childbirth. Thank you. Gosh, almighty Lord, look at this. But before she passed away, the midwives tried to encourage her. Don't be afraid, they said. You have a baby boy. But she, but she did not answer nor pay attention. But verse 21 says, this is right before she, she'd give birth and she's dying like directly after she's given birth to the child. Verse 21 says, the name of the child, Ichabod. Ichabod, amen. For the glory of the Lord hath departed from Israel. God's glory is gone. She named him that because the ark of God had been captured and because of her father-in-law and her husband were dead. And then she said, the glory of the Lord has departed from Israel. The ark of God hath been captured. And she died, plumb down to the daughter-in-law, had died. I don't know. It don't really go into what happened to the child or anything really past that point right here at, the, at this story. But God has complete. I mean, just taking these people out down down the line because that's what God said that they were going to do because of their rebellion. And so, in chapter five, kind of finishing up this story right here before we go into First Kings the eighth chapter, right here in chapter five. So the ark obviously is captured by the Philistine army. Uh, the ark is brought in by them. And if you ever have heard Pastor preach this message on how, <laughs> how the people, uh, the Philistine people have got hemorrhoids, it's Samuel, the fifth chapter. Or it's 1 Samuel. And you'll read that in 1 Samuel. Where the <laughs> and, 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 well, the New Living Translation said that they had tumors. But if you read it <laughs> in the King James, um, it's pretty much saying they got hemorrhoids. So, because it says that they had them in their inward parts. So... Uh, you know, I, whatever that would be, I guess, you know, obviously down in that area. So, uh, <laughs> and uh, so anyway, so the Philistines get this. God strikes the men, the men but from, from old to young with hemorrhoids. And <laughs> it strikes them so bad. 
that the cross can be heard literally in the next city. It shocks them so bad, they're in such turmoil that they put the ark on a wagon with some calves. They're like, well, there's no way. We can take this thing back. So, yeah, we put this ark on the calf. On, on, the, on the wagon with these calves. And they send the ark down the road straight away. And, the ark, and, and God, God guided the animals straight away. And then God's people recovered the ark. Look at that. Is so, that is so amazing. All right, so I want to kind of transition this, this message real quick into 1 Kings, the 8th chapter real quick. 1 Kings chapter 8. So remember now, the, these men were in total rebellion. Uh, and totally disobedience to what God has called them to do. And the glory of the Lord departed out of their life because of the choices that they make against God. But 1 Kings, the 8th chapter, we're not really going to read a whole lot of this. I'm kind of just going to really explain to you what really what's going on at this point. Uh, I'll read maybe just a little bit here. Uh, so they're, they're taking the ark of God out of the house of David. And they're bringing the ark of God to the new temple that Solomon has just built. And Solomon has just built this in the first few chapters. Literally, it's just now completed here. And he calls actually for kings beyond his region to help bring men in to cut down fine cedar so he could be used to build the house of God because it was heavily cedared in through the temple of God. So Solomon calls for help. The temple of God is built. Solomon brings the ark of God out of the house of David also known as Mount Zion, brings it into the new, the new temple that Solomon had built. And, and he had put it into the inner part of the temple, which is pretty much the holy of holy at this point. So the ark is placed in there. And the Bible says in verse 10, when the priest came out of the holy place, a thick cloud filled the temple of the Lord. Verse 11, the priests could not continue their services because of the cloud. For the glorious presence of the Lord filled the temple of the Lord. So they, Brother Chris, they had to stop what they was doing because the glory of God was so profound and so, and so strong that they couldn't even continue their work. The, the, the Bible says that the cloud was so thick they just had to stop what they was doing and back up and let God just have his way. And, and I was talking to the brothers the other night. I was talking to them about two Wednesdays nights ago, or two weeks ago on a Wednesday night. We had such a powerful service here. I was, telling, I was telling Brother Jonathan, Brother Brent the other night, and, and Brother Brent was here, and everybody that was here knew the experience that they had felt here when the glory of God set upon the church of God. Let me pause it for a moment. If you're, if you're wondering what this is on my head, let me kind of just point that out. If you're wondering what this scratch is here, I hit a pole at work. I'm walking. I know you're probably wondering. Okay, I bend my head down a lot. You're probably wondering what that is. Let me, I'll go on just a second. I was working. There's this big T line that you hang clothes on. I'm going down, I'm working, I, I ran that thing. You thought I was a bull. I ran that thing, and I, I, I hit it so hard, I took the paint off of it. And uh, well, anyway, so that's what that is. I've not, I, no, I've not been, I've been marked for the Lord, I guess you could say, amen. Not Cain's side, he's, he's wicked, amen. So uh, anyway, so the glory of God set so profoundly upon this body here last, two Wednesdays ago that I, it, was, it, was so, it was so amazing. And I was telling the brothers about it, what, what we experienced in 1 Corinthians. I think it's the first chapter. It might be even be verse 31. It says, if any man glory, let it be in Christ. Or if any man boast, let it be in the Lord. And saints of God, what I'm about to say, I boast in Jesus because of his presence. I boast in Jesus because of his glory. I boast in Jesus because of the anointing of God that set upon the house of God that Wednesday night, just like, just like it set upon the house of the Lord in 1 Kings, the 8th chapter. Now, it left in 1 Samuel because of disobedience. It left because they, choose, they chose to rebel against God, and they didn't surrender their lives. They would not yield to the commandments of God, so the glory of God departed from Israel. But God's glory returned when the ark was brought back to God. So God's glory was so evident here that Wednesday night. It was so manifested here that Wednesday night. My God in heaven, it felt like we literally, I've, I've never, and, and if you've been drunk in your life and you're now born again, glory be to God. But if you've never been drunk, praise be God to that, for, for that also. And I've never been drunk in the natural, never. 
I've never, and I've been high before, but I've never been drunk before. But I tell you what, Wednesday night, I was on some new wine. I'm, I'm dead serious, amen. I was on some new wine. Last went two Wednesday nights ago, wasn't we, Brother Chris? Friend, I'll tell you what, if we wasn't in the third heaven, we was at least in the second heaven, my dear brother. I was on some new wine, total plastered in the Holy Ghost. I mean, it's a wonder that the, the glory of God was so strong in this house of God. Literally, our footing was almost begin to, we, we almost like we couldn't walk straight because the presence, and the, I'm like, like, oh, hallelujah, because the glory of God is so strong. And I'm feeling, Lord, it felt like I had been sentenced to the electric chair, excluding all the pain and all the discomfort through that process. Lord, have mercy. I felt the anointing of God from the top of my head to the soles of my feet. It felt like I stuck my hand in a light socket, amen. We got hooked up to that living water, hooked up, God, to that divine power. The anointing God of the Holy Ghost began to sweep through the body of Christ. And all we know how to do, just we just begin to take it in. Woo, I just, I'm like, oh God, it's a wonder. It's a wonder that God's glory, that Jesus' presence wasn't so strong. that it's a, If it was any stronger than what it was, I would have probably fell out in the Holy Ghost with nobody touching me. I'd probably been, I mean, I'd just totally, totally go out with nobody touching me. That's the glory of God. That's how strong it was. And, and it reminds me because, it reminds me, Brother Brandon, how human we are. It reminds me, Brother Chris, that sometimes, it, it actually reminds me of Daniel. I think Daniel, can you pull verse chapter 10 up, verse 10, if I'm right on that, please? This is really good. Read this right here. Of course, you know Daniel's situation. You know the angel appeared to him. He fell on his face pretty much as a dead man. But I want you to read what verse 10 says in chapter 10. And behold, a hand touched me and set me upon my knees and upon the palms of my... So, so Daniel said, a hand touched me, and that's what I did. So this angel appeared to Daniel. When it touched him, he just fell. Why? Because Daniel's flesh can only handle so much. And that reminds me, Brother Chris, two Wednesday nights ago, my God, how human we are, amen. How this flesh can only handle so much. Brother Joe, it can only handle so much power. It can only handle so much anointing. It can only handle so much glory. So much glory of God's presence. But it reminds me also that there's going to come a day. There's going to come a day, the Bible says, even at the last trump. Now, friend, I've never, Brother Joe, I've never took a trip to the Middle East. I've never been to Israel. I've never been in the city of David. I've never been to the Middle East. But one day if, if, if the Lord don't descend with the shout of the voice of the archangel in my time, if I'm awaiting my rest, I know that one day he's going to call me up out of the grave. And I know that one day this body, this body is going to raise from corruptible because the Bible says this corruption must put on incorruption. This mortal must be put on immortality. Then will come to pass the saying that death where is your sting? Oh grave where is your victory? Paul said flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. We're putting on new bodies brother Chris at the last trump. I'm taking a direct flight at the last trump up out of the grave. Amen. I'm taking a trip. Amen. Up to the sea of glass. Amen. I'm taking a trip to the sea of glass and when we begin to praise God even at the, up at the sea of glass. Amen. Right now sometimes I begin to praise God, but I lose my shout because I lose my voice sometimes. I begin to preach sometimes and lose my voice. Why? Because my God, this flesh and this blood can only handle so much. Oh, but I'm reminded, and when I'm at the sea of glass, that the glory of the Lord will sing a new song, amen. We'll have a new song to sing. My God in heaven, angels step back for just a moment and let me sing my song, amen. Woo! Why, because I'm going to have a body like unto his glorious body. A body, Sister Carolyn, that can praise God forevermore. A body that will never grow weary. A body that will never lose its praise. A body that can praise him forever. Woo! My God in heaven. Woo! Could you imagine that? Before the throne of God in the sea of glass. Worshiping God. Giving God all the praise. I'll have a body like unto his glorious body. So right now I'm a little short-winded because I'm flesh, I'm human. Amen. But there'll come a day I'm going to put on a new body. Amen. I'm going to put on a new body. First Corinthians, or let's go to Romans, the 8th chapter, verse 8, 18 real quick. Verse 18, yet, yet what we suffer, nothing now is not, yet what we suffer now is nothing to be compared 
to the glory, oh yeah, to the glory he shall reveal in us later. For all creation is waiting eagerly for that future day when God will reveal unto his children who they really are. So there's going to come a day. Oh my God, Paul said that this suffering of this present time is not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us, Brother Brent, later on. Amen. Amen. Yeah, Brother Chris, we're going through some things sometimes, brother. But when we get hooked up like that, amen, it gives us a vision of what we're going to do for eternity. It gives us a vision of the body that we're going to have, Chris, that we can worship God forever, that I can never get tired, amen. I can't even cry. There'll be no more sorrow, amen. No more death, no more pain. Oh, God in heaven, for the former things are passed away. Yeah, I know, friend, yeah, the thousand-year reign in chapter 20 of Revelation looks pretty good, amen. And the Bible says for the first resurrection that they raised to life and lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. And yeah, I'm looking forward to living and reigning with Jesus in the first resurrection for a thousand years. Oh, but when the thousand years expired, Brother Joe, John said, I saw the new Jerusalem. That's what I'm looking forward to, amen. He said, I, I saw the new city of God. He, John said, he said, it was coming out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband, amen. Amen. Oh, he said, I saw it. He said, I saw no more sea. I saw a new heaven and I saw a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away and there was no more sea. And I saw this city clear as crystal coming from God out of heaven. Woo! Could you imagine that? 1,500 miles wide, 1,500 miles up. My God, three gates on each side of the city. Every gate's got its own pearl. The gate itself is a pearl made from a round pearl. Thinking, my God in heaven. Woo! That the gold is transparent. I mean, literally, Brother Chris, it's so pure. If we had hair, we could comb it in. <laughs> that Brother Chris, we could get so excited, so full of the Holy Ghost. That we can run, we can run an aisle. I mean, run, and I'm not talking about just running out of your pew. <laughs> I'm talking about run down the transparent street of gold yeah. and never lose a never lose a win. <laughs> Woo! Hallelujah. <laughs> but are you willing? Yeah. Are you willing for that, Brother Joe? Because the two different stories is when we were obedient and when we were disobedient. So, and that's your choice, is to whether you want to obey the word of God or whether you want to disobey the word of God. Amen. Uh, pull up Titus uh, 2, verse 12, please. Titus 2, verse 12. I'm going to read that in just a second. I'm going to read 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 20. It says, but Paul said this to Timothy. But in a great house... They are, they, are not also, they are not only vessels of gold or silver, but also of wood and of earth, some unto honor and some unto dishonor. If any man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, meet for the master's use, prepared unto every good work. Verse 19, nevertheless the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his. Let him, you look at this, let him that name, the name of Christ, depart from iniquity. Amen. Amen. The Bible says if we say that we know him, we ought ourselves to walk even as he walked. Titus chapter 2 verse 4 teaches us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, that we should live soberly, righteously, and godly, in this present world. Again, look at that. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, that we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Because this is what Paul's talking about. He said, I bring my body under subjection, lest that by any means, when I would preach to others, others, that I myself may not be a castaway. So Paul said, I press toward, Brother Chris, the mark of the high calling in God in Christ Jesus. So Paul knew that there was a fight to be fought. Because he said, I fought the good fight, Brother Brim. He said, I have finished this race of mine. He said, and because I finished, Brother Chris, 
He said, there's a crown of life waiting for me. He said, not only for me. He said, but all of those that love the appearing of Jesus Christ. So saints of God, are you willing today to pay the price in your life for the glory of God to be revealed in your life? Brother Chris, the anointing of God revealed in your life. Are you willing to pay the price for God's presence, God's glory, and God's anointing to be placed over your life? Or will we let sin go unchecked in our lives and expect God to be okay with it just like Eli and his sons did? Completely disobedient, completely stubborn, knowing that God is correcting them. And you know that today. You know that in your life today. If you've got the Spirit of God, you know it. Amen. The Bible says they that are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. That's what the Bible says. And you've not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you've received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. So if you've received the spirit of adoption, let him that names the name of Christ depart from sin, then we shouldn't be out here letting sin have dominion over our bodies, that we should obey it in its lust thereof, the sixth chapter of Romans says. Because, saints of God, I want the anointing and I want the glory of God to set on my life. But you know what? There is a price to pay for the anointing of God. There's a price to pay for the glory of God. There's a price to pay for the power of God to be in our lives. And there is also a price to pay for sin and for disobedience. Amen. Disobedience is as witchcraft, as the sin of witchcraft. My God, little Samuel raises up and anointed Saul as king. What's this bleeping in my ear, Samuel says? You know the commandment of God. You know what God told you to do. Take them all out. I want no animals. I want nobody left. I don't want the king spared. You take them all out. What's this? Man, what's this I hear? What's this garbage in my ear I hear? Huh. And Samuel says, all right, because you've rebelled. God's rejected you as king. Amen. Amen. All throughout the word of God, you find this time and time and time and time and time again. God, God reaches out. God tries to correct, Brother Chris, but we don't listen. It's not that we're unfamiliar with it, Brother Chris. It's not that we, Brother Jonathan, it's not that we don't know that area that God's trying to chisel away in our members. Because the Bible says, mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, right? Mortify, make those areas dead in us, Brother Joe, so that we can, when we come before Christ in that first resurrection, that we have fought the good fight. And that like Paul, we have finished the race. And like Paul, he said, follow me for I follow Christ. Let's bring these bodies under subjection. Lest that by any means, would I, I could be up here preaching to you today. And later on, even be a castaway, Paul said. I could let my word, you know, who am I? You know what I've learned? I've learned that wh whoever you are, Brother Brent, when nobody's watching, is exactly who you are to God. I've learned that. Who are you? When you're at home and you're in your room all alone and you're all by yourself and you got that you got that phone right before you and you're just scrolling through Snapchat and you're just scrolling through Facebook and well what are you taking in? What are you watching? I'm talking about when, when pass is not there for accountability, when we're not there, when the Sunday school teacher's not there. I'm talking about when it's just you, your phone, and God's there. And God's watching you. Oh. Oh, yeah. Oh, they th just like David. My God in heaven. David thought he'd sweep his garbage under the rug and what he'd done. But God seen it. God told Nathan, you're this man. You're this man, David. You've done this evil in the sight of God. And David's like, oh, I'm him. Because we can't hide nothing from God. So why would we even try, Brother Joe? I want God's glory. I want God's anointing. I want God's presence. So I'm willing to lay aside every sin. I'm willing to lay aside every weight, which so doeth easily beset me, Brother Joe, that I can run this race with patience that's set before me. Paul said many are running. Everybody's thinking they're running. Everybody thinks they're born again. Everybody thinks they're saved. Many run. One obtained the prize. He said you better run that you may obtain it. No one's crowned for majesty unless they strive for it lawfully, he said. You're not going to get crowned unless you do this right, unless you do it the right way. Amen. When you're at home, even outside the phone, and the Spirit of God's right there with you. Oh, he's right there with you. And you're, and you're watching this profanity on your phone. And you know the glory that shall be revealed in you later on. You know about the first resurrection. You know what's going to take place in your life. You know how this is something we strive, strive to enter in at the straight gate. For narrow is the way which leads to life, but broad, broad is the way which leads to destruction, and many be the enter therein. So we know this is a narrow way. And not, now, am I saying that we're going to be perfect? Absolutely not. But should habitual sin remain in our lives? 
You're a fool if you think that. You're a fool if you think habitual sin should remain in your life and it will stand before God. And, and the Spirit of God says, I've convicted you time and time again. I've told you. I've showed you. It's wrong. It's wrong. Stop it. Stop, stop, stop. Now, and, and, and it's those things that you know absolutely without a doubt. You could, Brother Joe, you couldn't even justify it no longer because God's done showed you so many times. God's used people to tell you. God's used people to show you. But we won't take heed to God's instructions. That's what happened to Eli. God told Eli. Eli didn't listen. God told Samuel. Samuel told Eli. Eli still didn't listen. Because Eli, Eli wasn't willing to correct his children. Just let them go on, pump, pump heathenize herself. Let them do whatever they want to do. And expect God to be okay with that. And they take the ark of God to the battle the second time. Because they think God's going to be okay with their sin and bless them anyway. So you think God's going to be okay with the rebellion, Brother Joe, that's in our lives. When we stand before God at the last trump. And we give an account thereof on the day of judgment. When we stand before God. God's not going to be okay with that. Now, again, do we fail? Absolutely. Do we come short of the standard of God at times? Most definitely. Brother Joe, should I... All right, for an instance, everybody knows I'm a technician for Terminex. And I'm in many houses all the time, many houses. And remember now, the man you are when nobody's watching is the person you are, Brother Earl. It's the person you are, Sister Lindy, when nobody's watching. Sister Lindy, I thought about this story, just sidetrack for a second. When, when Eli fell back and broke his neck, it broke his. It fixed your back when you fell. So as you, she'll test about that later on. Amen. Anyway, so and, and this rebellion that's in our lives, saints of God, we've got to deal with. And so God's trying to check our fruit today. Are we ready? Are we ready for that first resurrection? Are we ready for that prize of the mark of a high calling in Christ Jesus to be glorified with these new bodies, to, be, to have a glory like unto his glorious body? Amen. Amen, saints of God. It matters. It matters. I, want, I, I try you today. I mean, in those areas that you, you, again, like you know the spirit of God's convicted you on, but you won't let go of. You won't let go. I pray the fear of God just comes over his body right now so strong. Uh, you just give me just a moment, and we're going to deal with this just a second. I pray the fear of God on this body right now. I really do. I pray it so strong right now. I pray great conviction come by this body right here, right now, that the Holy Ghost will walk these pews. And I mean turn people's hearts because of their, our, our rebellion and our disobedience that's in our lives. And saints of God, we, we've all been in rebellion. We've all been in disobedience. I was at one time letting my children just have tablets. And just, you know, because it would get them out of my hair for a while. I'd give them, tab their mother-in-law, their mama would buy them tablets. And we'd just give them to them. And they'd sometimes watch some of the stupidest stuff. Ungodly. Unholy stuff. Stuff that they should never have their eyes laid on. And they'd get on YouTube. And YouTube is such a portal for the enemy. YouTube is such a portal. Such a portal for, for spirits to enter in to those little children. And, and so... Thank God for a man of God that stood right here, Pastor Jerry, and preached against the thing in my life. I find that, that tickles me to death. I mean, it just, it, it, and the word of God, Brother Jonathan, why, why is it that when, when men of God stand and they begin to shell the corn and they begin to take this, the scales off our eyes and show us, it's the spirit of God that does it and reveals in our lives the things that we need help on, the things that we need to get closer on, the things that we need to mortify, the things that we need to let go and, and let God have and let God take it from us. And, and somehow we get, all of a sudden, the man of God begins to preach and then our blood pressure begins to rise. <laughs> We're like, I mean, we just get plum ill. We're just like, you get hot. I mean, you get ill. Her blood pressure's going up. You're like, who does he think he is? Well, that's self-righteous. He's a man of God up there preaching the word of God to correct you. Why? How many times? Out of anybody. Out of anybody up here preaching this message. How many times pastor preached ready for the resurrection? My God in heaven, he's hammered away more at that. And he's, ha, and he's about preached anything. Why? Because he's getting us prepared. Getting us ready. Because he knows I've got to make it. He knows I've got to get God's people ready, ready to go. And so we had these tablets in our lives, and we were being disobedient, and the word of God came forth, and we had a choice to make. We were going to let them things go or be disobedient and keep them. So we let them go, and they still don't have them. We still use them to this day from, I don't know, months and months and months ago since pastors preached that. Um, so, and, you know, and I'm, and I'm praying that there's other parents in this church that, Realize that same thing for their kids. I really do. Because there they should be no child in this church under the influence of technology outside of your supervision. Never. 
I don't care if your child's 15, I don't care if your child's 8 or your child's 12. Your child should never have a phone or a tablet took off to a room or to an area in the home by themselves with no supervision. That's foolishness. It is absolute foolishness to do so. It is. And, and you know, and, and, and things have happened, and, and this has happened before, and, and kids begin to get night terrors and things because of these things, you know, that, that were opening the door. Because I don't want to be, and that's an area in my life that I had to let go. It's an area in my life that I had to let go. And the strongest area right now that I'm fighting, completely honest with you guys, if I'll confess my fault before you, and I can do that, is the, the biggest area that I struggle with in my whole entire walk with God is my seven-year-old Elijah right now. The way me and discipline Elijah. Because Elijah, he is, at this point, just like a lot of seven-year-olds are, but some are different. And Elijah is really rebellious at this point, extremely rebellious. And now, let nobody kid you. You can, ask my, you can ask my father-in-law, you can ask my wife, you can ask my family. We don't let up on that boy. We, we, he gets it, and he, he gets the rod of correction because he's got to have it. Because the Bible says that's what drives the rebellion far from the child. But I've got to learn in my spirit, Brother Jonathan, not, and again, because the man of God stood, right? Not to do it in retribution or to get my ounce of flesh back or because, or because he's done something against me. No, he's done something against God. So I'm taking that and I'm trying to apply that to be so effective in my life because that is the biggest area that I deal with. And surely, saints of God, if I can sit here and tell every one of you the main thing I deal with, then you know God knows. I mean, come on. God knows what you're going through. What, can, can you do that today? If you, I mean, God already knows what you're going through. God already knows what you have in your life. God already knows what you're dealing with. God already knows what we're holding on to, what you're even struggling with. There's one thing to have a struggle. Now, you know, again, this ain't something I do 24-7, you know, uh, uh, 365, seven days a week. It's not something like that. Now, that would be habitual rebellion, something we remained into all the time. It would never change, never ending. It's perpetual, never ending or changing. That's what God wants to take from us today because we're striving. And saying to God, I pray that the area Today in your life, I pray that right now, I mean right now, under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, I pray that God would reveal the area you're disobedient in. The area that you know without a shadow of a doubt, don't even fool nobody. That when you, if you stood before God, God would be displeased with it, at least. So you know that area, and I'm praying right now, if you're under the sound of my voice, I pray that the Spirit of God has touched your heart in such a way that, he, that he's reminded you once again of this great glory that's going to be revealed in us and this resurrection that's going to take place in us. But saints of God, let's let some weight go this morning. And, 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 and saints of God, I, and I know when I, when I stand, when I stand to minister, I stand a lot to correct because that's my gift. Uh, Brother Calvin, he's an exhortation preacher. He, he exhorts, he, he uplifts and encourages Brother Calvin's gift. Um, so, and mine is... It's pretty much correction. It's just my gift. So a lot of times when I stand, I stand to correct because that's what God's given me the gift and the ability to do so. So I try to operate in that gift. And so, and like pastor, he's getting us ready for this end time. So saints of God, I want you to ask yourself right now. Now I mean right now before God. I want you to bow your heads real quick. Everybody bow their heads. Each saint of God in this house of God right now, I want you to bow your head for just a moment. And you ask yourself, you ask yourself an honest question. Don't you lie to yourself because you, God already knows. You be honest with yourself and you be honest with God. Am I ready for the resurrection? Am I ready for the first resurrection? Will I make it? Will he say, enter in, thou good and faithful servant, in whom I am well pleased, enter to the joy of the Lord that I have prepared for you. For you have been faithful in a few things. Are you faithful tonight? Are you willing to pay the price for God's glory? Are you willing to pay the price for God's anointing to be placed over your life? Or do you want to pay the price for disobedience and keep that area in your life and have no anointing, no power, and then be dis displeasing in the sight of God and not ready for the return of Jesus Christ? Won't you just come this morning to get help? As Brother Joe's about to come and close just in a moment. If that's you this morning, if there's an area that you would like to get closer in, if there's an area that you'd like to surrender to Jesus this morning, if there's an area this morning that you'd like to surrender to God because you know you need help in this area. You know this area is not okay. You know God's not okay with it. Although he's familiar with it, he's not okay with it. 
How about this morning? How about now? Won't you come now and get help? Won't you come now and let God touch that area? God give you grace. God give you deliverance. My God, you might need prayer for this. Well, let, let us pray over you that God would deliver you from this. Let us pray over you that God would set you free from this. That God would take you out of this. Or whatever the need is this morning in your walk with God that's hindering you from running this race with patience that is set before you, you come this morning. Brother Joe, I'm done. It's a challenge, isn't it? It's always a challenge. If we go back to the book of Genesis, we find that in the garden, God gave us charge of things. It's called stewardship. We talk about the offering a lot and paying our tithes, and, but sometimes I think we forget that Everything we have doesn't belong to us. It belongs to God. Did you know if you own your house free and clear, it's not free and clear? The city, the county, and the state all have an automatic lien against it just in case you don't pay your taxes, just in case you don't do something. God gave us charge of everything in the world. But he said, you're watching it for me. The money we make, the things we own, those are all part of our stewardship. We know the story of the unjust steward who lost his stewardship and had to be judged and punished for his failure. But when you're a good steward, the boss comes up and says, hey, you did a good job. It makes you feel good. When I was a young manager, a, train, a trainer told me one time, said, you ever thank your people for doing a good job? And I said, well, no, I pay them to go, do a good job. He said, you're going to have a lot of trouble. You need to learn to say thank you. You know, God tells us thank you for doing a good job, by rewarding us, by giving us peace, by giving us joy, by giving us love, by making life bearable. Things are not easy anywhere for anyone. I look at one man and I say, oh, he's got it made. But if I knew what he went through, I'd know he doesn't have it made any more than I do. And if he doesn't know the Lord, he doesn't have it made at all. Not even close. So we're going to take our offering this morning like we always do. But I want you to think about everything you have is not yours. It's loaned to you. Doesn't matter whether it's material. Your children are loaned to you for you to raise. Your life is loaned to you to live for the Lord. Everything we have is actually just a stewardship, just something God gives us for us to manage and take care of. Come forward. Lord, we thank you for the chance to give back to the kingdom. We thank you, Lord, to have an opportunity to acknowledge that you are the one that gave us everything we have. So, Father, right now, ask you to bless each one of us to inspire us to give back to you to support the work of the Lord in Jesus' name. Come forward and give your gifts.
do have a few announcements. Women's prayer next Tuesday, 6.30, I assume here at the church. Of course, it's a bad thing to assume. We know that little grill, little grill door. Christmas play, Saturday, December 17th at 5. That's kind of early. I might be able to make that, get home before dark. <laughs> uh, our prayer list is basically the same. You know who needs to be prayed for? Every one of us. Every one of us. I'm going to emphasize that every time I close the service. We all need prayer. And not only do I need your prayer and you need mine, but when I pray for you, I forget about me for a few minutes because you and I are our own worst enemies because we think about me. Yeah, we do. We think about ourselves. How's this going to affect me? What am I going to have to do? What's this going to cost me? It's always about me, me, me. Put your mind on someone else and it lightens your own load as well. Father, we're grateful for the message Brother David delivered today. We thank you, Lord, for the words of encouragement, the words of understanding, the need that we have, Lord, to always pattern our life the way you told us to. That there are no times that we can let things slip because one little slip is so obvious absolutely destructive if we allow it to be. So, Father, we ask you to bless each one of us. Give us courage and strength. Father, open our hearts and our minds and let us live the word that we learn in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, there's an old poem that says, For the want of the nail, the shoe was lost. For the want of the horse, for the want of the shoe, the horse was lost. For the want of the horse, the message was lost. For the want of the message, the battle was lost. It's all progressive. You're going up, you're going to go down. Your choice. Make a good one.